Hi everyone, my name is François Parlant and today I'm happy to walk you through the exam we had today where you had to create a kind of dashboard where every chart moves depending on the data you are selecting. Let's start. Here is the main sheet and thank you to Stefan for providing the data. We have data. It looks like a table, but of course, when we click inside, we have no table over there. So it's not a table. It's a good idea to put it into a table. If you are on Mac, it's command T. And if you are on PCs, it's usually control L. I'm going to do control L. If you don't like shortcuts, just go to home and you've got the possibility to format as a table over there. Or you can go to insert and you can put it into a table too. Let's do my usual shortcuts, which is command L in my French Excel. Now, we have a table. That's great. Let's check the second sheet. The second sheet is about the price range. Here we have some text and I'm almost sure we will have to put that into a, that, a table. But for now, let's leave it and see what we have next. The retailers. Well, that might be put into a table. Let's zoom in. Of course, there is no title. If I click my shortcut, maybe it's a, not a good idea to tick the box. Let's let Excel add a title. And here we can put retailers. That will be easier for later to remember what this list is about. The next sheet is about the products. Once again, we've got some data. Oh, there are some titles. I hope Excel is going to recognize that when I put it into a table. Let's try. Well, no, the box is not ticked. Let's tick it for Excel. And now the titles are correctly set. In the challenges, we've got a little list with what we understand to be weak numbers. Let's put that into a table. Seems nicely formatted and we'll check that later. Let's see the cities. Well, when we go there, it looks like a table and that's it. We've got table design over there. So everything seems OK for this. And we'll see later for the dashboard. Let's go back to data. Usually the data that you are working with is getting out of hand when people start spelling things differently. Of course, it would be a good idea to make sure that everyone spells the same way each of the retailers. And that's how you can do it with a drop down. Let's start by selecting the column. You can see that you have the black arrow at the top of this table column. Now, if you want a drop down list with only a set of spelling for the retailers, you can go into data and you can go to the icon data validation. That's the way to tell only a certain set of words are allowed in this column. I'm going to click into data validation. I'm going to choose list because I want to restrict this column to a list of, num of names and the source is in the retailers page. So I'm going to click in the source, go into the retailers and I can select all the retailers names. I click OK. And now when you go into a cell, you've got exactly this list of names and you cannot write something else. I can write, for example, that if I hit enter, there is a message telling me, no, this value is not in the list. And that will be awesome because if you go down at the bottom of this table and if you want to add a new retailer, you will have to use one of this retailers list. The second competency that we would like you to have is a way to highlight important data in your workbook. Here, it would be very easy to highlight the cells where the product is 78 something three. For example, you can select the value, you can select the column, go into home, and maybe in conditional formatting, choose 
take that contains and you can type the value and of course everything is in red. But that's a bit too easy because most of the time you have a very long workbook and it would be interesting to have the whole line highlighted so that you can't miss the rows where there is this number or any valuable data that you might want to highlight. So let's undo this and do it the correct way to have the whole line in color. If we want to have all the columns in color, we must select not just one column, but all of them. And careful, make sure that the active cell, the one which is a little bit clearer, is not in the title, but it's correctly the first one of the data. Now, let's go into Home and let's go into Conditional Formatting and to New Rule because nothing of what is there can do what we want. Choose New Rule, Mac People, choose Classic, and then in the second drop-down, you have to choose the last one. PCs, choose the last one directly. Now, if you have a Mac, you already have some kind of color chosen. If you are on a PC, you have to go to Format and choose one of the colors over there. Let's choose, well, they're not very nice, but let's take one and we are going to do our formula over there. When should this cell become yellow? Well, when on the same line in this cell, we have the code of the product. So I should say equal, open the quotes, paste the code and close the quotes. The problem, I'm going to try and zoom in. It's going to be a catastrophe, but let's see it. The result is we have dollars in front of the F and dollars in front of the 12. That's a very big problem because when we are going to try and see if the row 13 should be in color, we mustn't look in row 12. If there is the, this number, we need to have a check on F. 13. So we need to take away the dollar in front of the 12. I'm going to try to unzoom. In case you know someone at Microsoft or Hewlett Packard, you might see that it's really annoying on some computers. You cannot click and go right in front of the dollar to remove it. Please, Microsoft, do something because it's really a pain when you have to rewrite everything that you have already written just to get away one dollar. It's really a bit messy. Now, once you have finished your formula, you can click OK and you will see that the highlight is all the way long on each row where you have this product code. One of the most important skills that you have to acquire in management is time management. And here, I would like to make sure that among all the formulas about dates that we've seen, you know how to work with one of them and that's the end of the month. Let's try it. I would like the due date to be the, the end of the month after the invoice date. To do that, let's try E of month and I'm going to choose the date. Of course, there is a slight thing that you need to improve about this formula. That's how to tell I want the month after it. And you mustn't write the real month after it. For example, this, the first one is in February. You shouldn't write something like three. You have to write how many offset month you want after that. And that is one. Now, let's try it. Oh, we've got something really weird happening. What is it? Of course, when you are next to one column, usually Excel expects to have the same format as the column before. Here, this is absolutely not what we want. So let's select the column. Let's go to home and let's make sure that we have a date over there. Don't worry, if you have your computer in another region, uh, localized in another uh, country, you might have the month first and the day after. I'm sorry, mine is in French region, so that's why we have this kind of due date. 
Now, let's see. This was the 14th of January, and of course, the end of the next month is the 28th of February. OK, this is the question you've been expecting the whole way. So let's check it. The main competency that we want you to master is the way to go from one table to another to bring some data here. For example, I've got a product code here. I would like to go into the products and have the product type for each product, whatever the order is, that goes back in my data table. And that's what can be done with many formulas. I say the one we've seen the most is VLOOKUP, which is the oldest one. And I'm going to show you also, for the people who've got uh, uh, Excel with subscription, you've got the new version, which is XLOOKUP. Of course, there is another way of doing it, which is with index match, but we haven't seen it very much this year. So let's forget about it for now and do our fantastic VLOOKUP. OK, first, you've got to take the element that will give you the product on the other sheet. So here we have to get the product code, semicolon. In my Excel, I have semicolon. Make sure to check on your Excel what is the separator in the little help that you have over here. If you have a comma, transform every semicolon that I put into a comma. Now. Once that I've done my semicolon, I can change page. I can go into product and I can select my table. Why will it work? Because I've taken a code and I'm starting the selection with a code, which means that the columns are in the right order for the VLOOKUP. Now, semicolon again. Which column do I want? Careful, you mustn't put a letter, you mustn't select the column, you must put a number. This is the first column of your selection. The product type is in the second one, so let's put a 2. Now you've got the last part. Do you want to search approximately the number in this column, which means if you've got another one that you find first, maybe you can take it even if it's not the one that you are looking for. No, 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 of course you don't want that. You want an exact match. You want to find the one you've taken in the first part of your VLOOKUP. So I'm going to choose false at the end. Now I can click enter and instantly Excel is going to take a code, go on the other sheet, take the right product name and do the next one under and under and will never fail. Let's check here if everything is OK. Yes, we've got every product type over here. Now, if you have Excel with a subscription, maybe you have the X lookup. So I'm going to add a column and I'm going to show you the way to do it with the X lookup, which is really fantastic. It looks a bit the same. So I need to take a product code as a start, semicolon, of course, change into a comma if you need to. We're going into product, but careful, this time we are not going to select the whole table. We only are going to select the column where I'm going to find the code that I've taken in the first place. Semicolon again. Now I'm going to take the product type. It's really interesting because sometimes you can't do the VLOOKUP because the columns are not on the correct order. Here, we don't mind because we take one and then the other. We don't care about the order. Now, you have to do to tell Excel what you want to see if you don't find the number over there. I'm going to put quotes and quotes to say, well, display nothing. That will be OK. Now you have to type semicolon again and careful. Instead of true or false that we have in the VLOOKUP, you've got four choices. And of course, the first one is the one I want, which is zero, meaning exact match. You can click enter and well, if we are lucky, we've got the same result. Of course, it did work. 
Now we would like to have the product category. In case you didn't notice, it's the same thing as the VLOOKUP we did earlier, but instead of choosing the second column, we need the third. So it might be a good idea to be very lazy, go where we have taken our VLOOKUP, let's take it entirely, I hit escape just to go outside of my formula, I'm going to type enter um, equal and then my formula, and of course, instead of two, I'm going to change into three to have the category. During our classes, I've insisted on the fact that the weeks in the year are not numbered the same way on each side of the Atlantic. In France, you've got a special way of counting the numbers of the week. And in the US, it's a bit easier if you have the January the 1st on a week. Well, that's the week number one. In France, no, it's more complicated. So here, let's see if you know how to get the week number, which is so important when you have to plan some deliveries across countries in international management. The formula to get the uh, number of a week is week num. Of course, it might be difficult to do a VLOOKUP with the uh, challenge uh, table over there without doing first a column where we calculate simply the week number for each of our invoice dates. So let's add a column which will be week num and we are going to do week num. Careful, you mustn't put ISO week num, which is the French version of counting here, that will be week num. Of course, when you are on a French Excel, it might be trickier because the ISO is at the end, so you've got two week num and you have to choose the correct one. I'm going to go here uh, no, that's not the due date that we wanted to have, it's the invoice date. So let's take the invoice date. And now we have a little semicolon to put to say where we want to start. Well, you can choose whatever you want, but uh, let's say if you choose Monday as the beginning of the week, that will be the French way. If you choose uh, Sunday, it will be the American way of starting the week, but not counting. You can do whatever you want. Let's say we choose Monday click enter and you should have three for the first one and that will be okay for me. Now let's check if that is a challenge. Okay, we would like to have here the word challenge if the week of this invoice corresponds to a week of challenge so that we can add maybe the turnover to your challenge goal. Of course, this question is again about VLOOKUP or XLOOKUP, but it's not about the formula itself. It's about how are you good enough to know how to transform the data to be able to do this simple formula instead of multiple if or ifs. Let's go into challenge and add a new column. That's going to be challenge. Of course, what are we going to do? We want to have the word challenge all over this column. So that's going to be easy. And what we want is in this column to have the word challenge when the this week is found on the other table. So let's do our VLOOKUP. I'm going to take this week number. I'm going to go into the challenges. I'm going to take this table. And of course, what I want is the second column, the one where I've written that this week is a challenge. Once again, this is an exact match, so I'm going to put false. Now, well, we've got lots and lots of NAs, and sometimes we've got, oh, this one is in the correct week, so that will be perfect. How to hide all those NA? Well, there is a very nice formula to do this. This is if NA. When you put an if NA around something, it will hide the NA and transform them into what you want. At the end of your formula, put semicolon and what you want instead. And I think what we wanted is normal.
and you can close the if and a. And now you've got normal and sometimes you've got challenge. I think it would be a lot easier with XLOOKUP because with XLOOKUP you don't have to put the if and a around. Let's see that. Let's add a new column for our XLOOKUP. Here I'm going to put equal XLOOKUP. I'm going to take the week number again. I'm going to go to challenge, careful, take one column at a time, first the week numbers, then the challenges, and that's where we have what will replace our if and a. If we don't find it, let's write normal directly inside the formula. And of course, we wanted exact match, so let's put a zero again and type enter and you will see we've got the same result as the VLOOKUP. Once again, we want to make sure that you have the competency of taking a data in one table and getting some data into another, because if you don't have this competency, you will have to check the rows one by one and of course you are sure to make a mistake and to lose a lot of time. Here we would like to have the region, so it's one, uh, once again a VLOOKUP, and we have a city code somewhere. So let's take the city code that we have. I click on it and before changing page, I'm going to put my semicolon. Let's go into the city table and here, well, we have the city, but it's a bit of a mess. I cannot select the whole table. Why? Because if we have taken a city code, I must start at the column where there is the city code and go to the right. Of course, actually, that might work. We don't even have to change the order of the column. We might start just at the city code and say, well, if you want the region, that's in the number two of our selection. So semicolon two. And now you can do a false because once again, you want exactly the region corresponding to the exact code that you have taken. So let's put false. Type it and you should have the correct region. Of course, another solution was to change the order of the columns. If you go into city, you might see that it would be a good idea to have the code and put it on at the front. Careful! If you go here and you've got green behind the letter of the column, that will select a very, very big number of columns and you won't be able to move it. You have to find the black arrow without the green, so it's a bit lower. When you're going to click, it's going to select the data, careful, find it again without the green there. If you type again, it will take the title. And when you go down, you can see only the data are selected, but the data and the title are selected. Now you can click on the border, go next, and it will move this column, and this column remains inside the table. You can click, that's table two. When you click, it's table two again, so everything is part of table two. Of course, if you do your VLOOKUP using this disposition, you will have to select the whole table, and the region will be in column one, two, three. When you are studying your data, most of the time you want to group things in ranges. That might be ages, that might be prices, that might be quantities. Here we have a price problem. So we would like to have instantly the price range put depending on the unit price. And we have somewhere the uh, price ranges over there and we have them the same way as we would have them in a contract that is in text but if we want to do formulas it would be a good idea to put that into a table let's do that what interests me is the start of the range and of course here the name of this range for example here the start is 15 25 
50 and 70 and 100. And we've got the name over there, which is cheap, medium, if I can spell them, high, gold, uh, and the last one is diamond. Okay, let's put that into a table because once we've done it, we don't have to put dollars anymore and that will be a very nice way to simplify our formulas. Now, instead of doing an ifs, that is doing if with multiple conditions, there is one formula that you know that can go here, check something and give you what is in the next column. That's the VLOOKUP. But you're going to tell me, yes, but if I've got a price which is something like 17, it's not going to find it. Yes, that's why we have at the end of the VLOOKUP a choice between exact or approximative. And that's absolutely what we want to try and to make sure that you know. So let's do our VLOOKUP. I'm going to take the unit price, which is uh, somewhere here, semicolon. I'm going to go into our price ranges and take the whole table because it's correctly organized. I'm going to take the second column and here I'm going to do an approximate match, which is true. And the approximate match is going Oh, maybe you don't know. What does the V mean in VLOOKUP? It means vertical, which means it's good to say from 15 it's cheap until it reaches 25. But even if it's 24, 99999, it's still on the cheap range. So that's perfect. Let's click enter and you can see that immediately all the ranges have been given to every one of our unit price. If you are very thorough, you might want to check here if there is something wrong. And of course, well, there is something awkward. We have some NAs. Let's check what is happening over there. If I check, I might discover that I've got some unit prices, where are they, which are 10. Well, we don't have that in our price ranges, so maybe we can change something. First solution, we can add an if NA, because we've seen that, and maybe we can call a new range, which might be, for, for example, extra cheap. Or another solution is to add a new row here. That may be what I'm going to do, because I want to show you how easy it is to maintain to change the values because we can change things here without changing the data inside the formula. So let's say maybe from zero on it's going to be extra cheap. I don't have to change my formula. I just have to go back and guess what? Well, everything is updated. I don't have NAs anymore. And if someone comes and tells me there is a new range, I don't have to take anything away from my formula. formula. I just have to change something in, in this little table, which is a lot easier to maintain. Now, I must tell you what is the improvement between XLOOKUP and VLOOKUP that we have just done. If we change the order of the data here, VLOOKUP is going to be completely confused because I told you VLOOKUP goes up from, from up to down, which is vertical, but is not able when everything is scrambled. For example, if I do that, it's going to be a mess here because you're going to th see things which are extra cheap and I'm almost sure they are not extra cheap, they are 40. So everything is wrong over there. Well, let's try and see if the XLOOKUP could do better. I'm going to add a new column here. I'm going to do an XLOOKUP equal XLOOKUP. I'm going to take the unit price, sorry for the scrolling. I'm going to put my semicolon. I'm going to go in the price ranges. Do you remember, one column at a time, semicolon. Here, I don't care about 
the NAs because at the end there won't be. And here I want to show you it will take exact match or the next smallest smaller item without taking care of the order. It will do the reordering for me if I choose minus one. It will be the correct solution. Okay, if you want to check, I'm going to put it back in the correct order here. It will be a lot easier for you to compare. And now you can see that we've got the same as the VLOOKUP, but really XLOOKUP is really awesome. So try it if you have it. Okay, now is the tricky part. There is one thing that we want all our students to be able to do is to copy data on internet and paste them into Excel. Well, there is one problem when you do copy and paste and you can't ask ChatGPT to do it for you, it's to clean the data, that is to see where the problem is. Here you've got 12,000 units, but if I do in a cell equal that plus one, well, it doesn't work. Why? Because this has been copied on internet in a table and it's been pasted there, but that's not a number. Look what is in the formula bar. There is units written at the end. And of course, we cannot do any calculation especially not a multiplication from the price to the number of units. We need to have a number over there. And that's why I asked you to clean this column to make it a number. And there are multiple solutions that we can use. The first one, the easiest one, is of course a call to artificial intelligence with the instant fill. Let's try that because the column where we have to do that is a bit far and I don't want to scroll all over the place. I'm just going to add a column here, but I've checked it will work even if you go on the other column. What do you have to do to make artificial intelligence work? Instead of giving the formula, the process to get to the result, you've got to do the opposite. You've got to give an example of the result and let the artificial intelligence find the process to get it. So here I've got something and I want a number. The result that I want is 12, 0, 0, 0. I click enter. Of course, now that I've given one example, I want the IA to do the job. I could do the shortcut control E. If I do control E, well, it's over. If you don't want to do control E, you can always go into data and find the little um, storm. Uh, how do you say that? I, I forgot the word in English, sorry. Lightning. You've got the lightning bolt here and you can click and it will work and it will give you numbers. And check what? If you do equal that plus one, well, it works because it's been taken into a number. Now, why or how would you do that with formulas? Let's try it. Oh no, before doing formula, there is another solution that I need to show you. I'm going to insert again a column and guess what? I'm just going to copy and paste that so that we can do it on this uh, draft column. There is another tool, do you remember? If you select the column, you can do Control H. In Mac, maybe you don't have Control H, you've got Control F. You can, do in, you can go into Home and you can do Replace. Because you've seen, here we've got units at the end and we don't want it. So I'm going to type space units. I'm going to leave the second uh, uh, box empty. I'm going to do Replace All. And it tells me that it has replaced something like 3,000 and lots of things and I can close it. Let's check, do we have a number? I'm going to take that plus one. Oh no, it's not a number, why? Because this works here, this doesn't work here. It works here, not here. Look at the screen, look at the screen. This works, not that. This works, 
not that. Do you see what is changing? Look here. This is a number, this is not a number. This is a number, this is not a number. Of course, if you copy numbers from internet, on internet, on a web page, if you want to have the thousands separated from uh, the other uh, numbers, of course, you have to put a space. But here, you don't want it, because if it's a space, it's not recognized as a number. Spaces are in the formatting, not in the typing. So, how do you erase the spaces? If you don't want to use a formula, you can do again Control H or go back into Home and Replace. And here, you want to replace what? All the spaces, so make sure there is one space. You want to replace it by nothing, so make sure there is no spaces. And you can click Replace All. And all the replacement has been made. And now guess what? Our formula works perfectly because this is a number without space. And so you can do additions and multiplications. Now, let's try and do it with formulas. The formula that replaces is substitute. You need to take the text that you had and you must say what you want to replace inside it. That's space units. And by what you want to replace it, that's double quotes, double quotes, which means nothing. Let's hit enter. Of course, this is not yet a number. If I do that plus one, it doesn't work. And I could use value, which is in French sinum, but it doesn't work because it's not recognized yet as something that could be a number. So here, maybe we have to do another substitution. You could have something like substitute. You can take that. What are you going to take away? The space. And what are you replacing it with? With nothing. And guess what? I think that will be a lot easier to work with. I'm going to take that plus one and it works. Careful, there is another formula that you might want to use, which is trim in English, suppress in French, but careful, suppress suppresses the spaces, uh, trim suppresses the spaces which are too much. But one space between words is not too much. It happens, so it won't work. You have to use substitute twice. But actually, I really do prefer uh, the instant field. And if you wanted a formula, that's to substitute, I think, to achieve it. The skill of observation and managing different formats for a simple copy and paste from internet is something that really is a nice skill that you might have from now on. The total is the unit price multiplied, careful, it's with a star, not with an X, multiplied by the unit sold uh, cleaned. And now if you want the operating profit, it's going to be the total sale multiplied by the margin, and I'm going to get it over there somewhere, that's 50%. And of course, you can maybe format this to be a bit better, so that might be better for me, and that should be okay. When you start to deal with big numbers, it's a good idea to be able to shorten them by dividing them by 1000. For example, I would like to have that divided by 1000 and I would like that to be in K dollar. A good way to do it, well, actually, there is another way to do it. It could be easier, but if you want to use pivot table and then charts, you need to have that into a column at the beginning. That's why I asked you to do it there. If you want that into K dollars, you are going to do a right click over there, format the cells, and here you can do something. Well, in the custom solution, oh, once again, it's a impossible to click in those tiny boxes. Please, Microsoft or Hewlett Packard, do something. Now you can do something to display it correctly. 
uh, one hashtag space hashtag hashtag zero and maybe we can have something like quote space and k dollars close the quote i'm going to try and zoom in for you to see a little bit i repeat hashtag space hashtag hashtag zero open the quotes space k dollar quote when i hit enter and i unzoom i've got something and if i had thousands it there would be a little space before uh, the hundreds if you want to have it in million dollars you just take the previous one you divide it by 1000 again of course here the numbers are so ridiculous that you have zeros and careful you have to create another formatting take the one you've just done and try to put it into millions and click OK. We will use it later, just leave it there. Now, let's see our last question. We wanted to make sure that above doing just the conditions, you were able to do something a bit more complicated. Here, it's an alternative. We want to have something outrange displayed when it's below 15 as a unit price or above 90. Of course, that's an if to do that, but you have to put an or inside of it. So let's go and check the prices. Now, the pr unit price may, must be either, where is it? Here. This unit price might be either below 15, semicolon, or this unit price might be above 90. That's the two conditions. You can close the parenthesis of the OR. And now when it's the case, you want to write outrange. Otherwise, well, nothing, I think. So you can close your alternative. And now, well, there is nothing, nothing, nothing. But sometimes you might want to see some outrange. Let's filter. It will be a lot easier to find them here, outrange. And we've got them over there. That's for the prices below 15. You remember we had some tens uh, before and I wanted to make sure that you had seen them to be able to add maybe in the price ranges this little row. So that was a second hint in case you didn't see the first time. And you should see something above 90 if they are. I'm not quite sure they are, but at least you should have them with this uh, formula. The charts that you were asked to do were the operating profit by category, by retailer and by region. Of course, if you have a large set of data, here we have something like almost 4000, you cannot do a chart with 4000 data. And when you have many columns, if you go into insert and you try recommended charts, well, you've got nothing. And if you have recommended pivot table, it's a mess because Excel doesn't know what to do. So you need to be able to summarize the data. And that's one of the most important skill that you have to manage with Excel. So let's do insert, click into the, the data first, go into insert and do a pivot table. Okay, I told you many times we are at uh, intermediate level, so you don't have to read everything. When you will be in next level, you will read a bit more and maybe you will be able to add this data to the data model, which is to do a pivot table with multiple table. But we haven't seen that this year. This will be for another time. So for now, just click OK. If I want to have the operating profit by retailer, I must take the operating profit. If you have it in dollars, take this one. If you want it in thousands of dollars, take this one. If you want it in millions of dollars and you have done it, take this one and put it there. And then you can take the retailer names. Okay, 
now we have numbers which are not too big but with too many decimals so I'm going to use remember the formatting that we used earlier I'm going to go into um, value field settings number format custom and I'm going to go just at the bottom of that because that's where we had our special formatting let's click it let's click OK and now we have something absolutely readable and we can go to insert and then we can add our I don't know I don't remember which one that is if it was a, a ring or if it was a bar chart but let's see we have it and we can click here to have data labels and then we can get rid of that remember Mac people you can click on your chart you can go into design and at the beginning you've got everything that you want to add to your chart and that should be into uh, data labels to have the same thing as me on the little plus on Windows and I think I don't like the grid lines so I'm going to take them away okay if I want to have another one I'm going to duplicate this sheet in PCs on PCs you can do control click move and you've got a second sheet where you can change everything you want usually I tend to erase the chart because it makes sometimes Excel crash when I do some changes here and there is too many data here so I'm gonna try and not to crash it yet let's do a saving before everything crashes now I don't want the retailers anymore so no that's not what I want I want the categories where are the categories I have no clue where they are if you see them just give me a call that's this one and maybe oh I think that's what was the ring so I'm going to redo it again and that was the ring and I would like to have the data labels and maybe I think it's not really readable I'm going to change the uh, format and I'm going to have the category name and I'm going to put that into a new line so this way I don't need to have that and I can have that a little bit outside and it's going to be perfect for now now if we want to have the charts on the same sheet we just add a new sheet we take the first chart and we put it there we take the second one careful click on another cell paste if of course you want the third one create the third one first and then we want them to move to move depending on what of course when we have many data what we want on the dashboard is to be able to see different perspectives and that's what we can do with filtering to do a filter be careful don't go into data don't go into insert and don't uh, insert a slicer where are they I don't even be uh, yes they are here that's not what's going to make your pivot table or your chart move you need to go on one of the charts go to analyze pivot chart analyze and then you've got to insert a slicer now we can take the price ranges if we find them somewhere here we are and now we have a slicer and really you know how much I love that because it's so easy to make data move by just clicking and you can select many things with just control to make it move but now we have a first chart on the dance floor dancing we want the other one let's right click on the uh, slicer let's click on report connections and let's click the second pivot table why do I have two because I duplicated the sheet most of the time if you have only one thing here it's because you redid a pivot table from the start and maybe you didn't take exactly the same selection and Excel cannot connect them so really duplicate the sheets with your pivot table that's the best way to have it working at the end now I click OK each time I click 
I've got both of them moving. Of course, if you had done the third, it would move because you would have three boxes to click. And now we have to do the dancing with the dates. For that, I click again on the chart. I go into pivot chart analysis, but insert, instead of choosing slicer, I'm going to choose a filter based on the dates and that the timeline. I'm going to choose the due date. I think that was what was asked. And now I've got months. And of course, well, there are months. Oh, that's 2022. It's not working. Now, uh, where, are, where is 21? Here. So now we've got some data moving. And if I want to connect it to both of my charts, once again, I right click on the timeline. I go to report connections. I click every chart, every pivot table that I have. And now it moves every way. If you want to have a number inside your chart, it's a good idea to click inside another cell, click uh, equal and go into one of your pivot tables and click into the total. Of course, it's a good idea to format it the right way. So for example, here, I'm going to go into format cell again custom i'm going to take the last one for the millions because i think that was in million and now i would like to add that above my chart so i'm going to go into insert i'm going to take a shape a little rectangle for example let's have it there i'm not going to write inside the rectangle i'm going to click in the formula bar directly i'm going to click equal and I'm going to click inside my little cell. I cannot do equal and go directly at the bottom of my pivot table. It's not allowed. I'm sorry. Now you can, of course, add a little bit of formatting, make that bigger, center, if I manage to do it. You can take away the filling so that we can see things more clearly. Same thing for the border. And now, it's going oh, to work and because it changes here, it changes here too. And now, of course, you can take your cell and move it behind the chart. It's still going to move uh, well when it moves, when we have data actually. Oh, that's because we have too, many, too few here. Now let's try to add a little bit of layout in here. If you want to insert an image, maybe you can do picture place over the sale and I'm going to do stock image. I'm not quite sure it's going to be nice, but okay. Uh, do you think we have something like shoes? Uh, we need to have something with a dark background. Otherwise we are not going to be able to really see what we've done. Maybe we could try with this one. Let's try it because it seems okay. And maybe we can have this in big. Okay, now I would like to have the charts above. So I need to put that at the back. And of course, if I want to have that empty, I'm going to click, right click on it, fill, no fill. And you can change the size of each of the labels by just selecting them and making them bigger. You could change the color if, uh, I think it was better in black actually, more readable. I'm going to leave it there. And you can do that for everything as you want. Careful, if you want to change the color of the slicer, you've got to click on it, go to slicer, choose something that's, well, the best as you can. And you see that you cannot change that. If you do a right click, you cannot modify it. But what you can do is duplicate it. So let's duplicate it. And now you can do the changes that you want. For example, for the whole slicer, you would like to choose the format and the fill. Well, what am I going to choose? Oh, it's going to be ugly. I'm sorry about that, especially if you are in marketing. I'm so sorry, but I need to do something quickly. Let's try that. Uh, it's going to be terrible, but okay. 
Oh, it didn't apply. Yes, of course, because I'm still on the former one. I've got to check the one I've created. And you can try with little changes to go back and change every possibility that we have here. Now you don't have to duplicate it anymore. You can just modify it and you can modify every part of it if I correctly click on it. Well, maybe not. And you can change every part of it as you wish. Now you can do the same thing on the timeline. You go to the timeline, you choose something that's almost what you want. Maybe I'm going to stick with the blue. You can duplicate it and you can change either the whole timeline or each of the part of it, same way as the slicer. So you can choose, click something, and then you can format it. For example, if you don't want the color to be something, you want it something green, or bold. Oh my God, it's going to be terrible. I'm so sorry about that. And then once again, you have to take the one that you have created. And here, oh, you can see I've got something in green. That's the part that I've changed it, changed. Of course, if you give this file to someone, you know what's going to happen. When they are going to add some new data at the bottom, they are going to break everything because there is one part where they have to be able to change the data, that's until column H. But after that, we've got some very nice formula that you spend some time to do. So we need to protect things. We need to let people be able to change the data from column H to B, but they shouldn't be able to change the rest. And that's how we can do protection. I'm going to select the place where the people can still do some changes. That's the first time uh, a list of columns. I'm going to do a right click on them and go to format cell. Now in all those tabs, the last one is about protection and see, it says that when we are going to protect the sheet, this cells are going to be locked. That's not what I want. All the rest should be locked, but not this one. So I'm going to unclick locked and click OK. Of course, for now, nothing happens because we haven't protected the sheet yet. So let's go into review and into review, you've got protect the sheet. So I told you many times for the exam, no password ever. Now, in real life, you might want to put a password, although it's fairly easy to break, but it might be a little protection. And you know the problem, each time some, someone needs to change something somewhere, you are on holiday and they don't have the code and it's a pain. So maybe do something very easy just to make sure that people by, um, ad in um, by accident don't change anything. But here, no password. Click OK. Now, imagine you can put something here. You might want to change to 51. It's allowed. Now, if you go into one of your formula and you want to erase it, it tells you no, you can't because that's, that part is protected, but not the first one. But there is a little problem. Now that we have protected the sheet, we cannot do a right click and insert a row because the sheet is protected. So I would like us to do a little macro, which is the recording of a series of actions. And these actions will be going to review, unprotect the sheet, come here, add a row and reprotect the sheet. So that's very easy. Once we have done that, we are going to add a little button with a plus so that the people will just have to click on the plus and it will add a row and it will unprotect and reprotect the sheet so quickly that people cannot break anything during this time. So to record a macro, we are going to first click in another cell than the first one so that when we go here, Excel records the fact that we go there. Now, we can go into view and at the end we've got macro and we can record a macro. And now we can give it a name. I'm going to call it add row. Careful, you mustn't put any spaces in here. 
Now make sure that you've chosen this workbook so that's where the macro is going to be recorded. When you're ready, when you found your calm, you can do click OK to start the recording. Click OK. I'm going to go into Review. I'm going to unprotect the sheet. I'm going to click in the first cell. I'm going to do a right click, insert, row above. Now I'm going to reprotect the sheet because I want to record this part. So protect the sheet and click OK. Now be careful, we need to stop the recording. So we go into View, Macro, and we click Stop the recording. Stop the recording, that's very important. Now, OK, we would like to add a little button. Of course, we cannot do that. Why? Because the sheet is actually protected. So for the last time, we need to unprotect it to add our button. To add a button, it's very easy. You go into Insert, into Shape, and you take whatever you want, a little heart if you want. Here, I'm an IT teacher, so I'm a bit boring, so I'm not going to do a, a little heart. I'm going to do a little rectangle. I'm going to add a little plus inside, and I'm going to center it. That's the way you can do your design, because usually you like to do some design. Now. I'm going to put a little style, maybe uh, ugly green. Oh, that's going to be terrible. Uh, anyway, it's going to work. Now, I've got the button. I've got the macro. I would like to link this shape to starting the macro. How to do that? Right click on the rectangle and go to assign a macro. Now, there is only one, so just click add row, which is the name of our macro. Click OK. Careful, it's not over yet. We unprotected the sheet just to put the button, but now we need to reprotect it so that everything is already done. We go to Review. We protect the sheet last time. And now, drums. Da -da 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 when I click here, it unprotects the sheet, adds a row, reprotects it so that I can not do some changes in my formula over there. Well done. Now, careful, if we did a macro, we need to save the file as class or a workbook allowing macros. So I'm going to go into File, Save As, and now I'm going to choose Excel macro enabled workbook. Click that and click save. Of course, the next step would be for you to go into view, into macro, into view the macros and into edit, which will help you discover this language of programming, which is VBA, maybe for another time. There is something truly fantastic about Excel is that when you prepare the settings for printing and you send your file to your boss, your client, the settings are kept, which means that I'm really annoyed when I do print and I've got something awful because it means that nobody took the time to take care about make something print ready. So please, let's go back and make sure that this is ready for printing. Select the area you want to have on the page that you want to print, and then you're going to Page Layout, you're going to Print Area, and you're going to click Set Print Area. Now you can go to Print again, and you can make some orientation changes. For example, here, it's not a good idea to have that in portrait. It would be better in landscape. And then I would like to have the <laughs> scaling better fit on one page. <clears throat> Mac people, you have to go into margin, custom margin, and then I think you have a little box to tick, or maybe it's already there to do the scaling fit into one page. It would be a good idea to have also some additional information. So, for example, the date at, at which you took this screenshot. 
Once again, I'm th I think for Mac people, you have to go into custom margin. Here on PCs, you've got to do page setup. And here you can go on header and footer and do custom header. Here, for example, I can put some text if I want, but I, I can also put the name of the file and it will be replaced by the name of the file all the time. I can put here, for example, the date. Okay, and maybe in the footer, I can put my name somewhere. So maybe uh, Francois or maybe the page and the total number of pages, which here should be one on one. And when I click OK, you will see that I've got information here and here, the date and here, the number of pages. And that's ready for the printing for my boss or my clients or my colleagues. Here is a recap of the skills that you've learned during this year, how to organize the data with tables, how to highlight with conditional formatting, how to format and apply custom formatting to the cells, how to use conditions with if, and, or, how to use the date formulas to manage your calendar. Here we've seen week, num, and end of months, but there are many others, especially that diff. How to summarize the data with a pivot table, how to clean up the data with text functions or instant fill or control H to remove things, how to visualize the summarized data with the charts and how to filter them with slicer and uh, timeline, how to link data from one table to the other, how to print or to prepare the printing, how to protect and a little bit of automatic automation with the VBA macros. Okay, I hope with this you know how to create this little kind of uh, dashboard that we've seen this year. I hope you managed to learn a few things. See you again soon. Bye-bye.